Um, my name's Mason. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and um, have experience with assembly organizing in a number of different contexts of um, building lasting neighborhood institutions that operate through assemblies, through assemblies as kind of one-off events of spaces of uh, democratic deliberation in the context of, context of actions or uh, movement organizations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the concretes of how, how we operate. Um, but I know there's lots of other people here who have direct experience with assembly democracy and assembly procedures. Um, and so I'm really just going to focus on kind of giving a, a bigger framing of how I think assemblies fit into the broader struggle for the transformation of society. And then we can kind of open up for um, you know, hearing from you all's experience, um, people who don't know as much wanting to ask questions about how these things work. Um, and we can have kind of a, a discussion in, in that sense. And um, the case I want to make is about the centrality of different forms of assemblies in the transformation of popular uprisings um, all over the world into revolutionary situations where institutions of the people assembled um, are not simply making demands of those in power, um, but become capable of actually making credible claims to power, to governance and authority over themselves and over their communities. And um, I'm sure many of us here are familiar with Chiapas and Rojava and the Spanish Civil War and all these kind of uh, big iconic cases of this, but this has also played a central role in the emergence of revolutionary situations in Bolivia, in Palestine, in Germany, in South Africa, in Nepal, and in many more than I could ever list um, in this discussion. So, first thing I just want to um, open with is why assemblies as a form? And I think the starting point for this discussion is thinking through some of the problems of systems of representation that direct democracy is designed or thought through um, as an attempted solution to. Um, the meaning of represent, it literally and etymologically, is to, to make present that which is absent. And um, I think there's a number of structural problems for processes of representation that prevent them from ever actually being able to do so, of being able to bring the absent into the present um, where decisions are made and where power is held. Um, so a few of these are the inherent informational inequality that is baked into how uh, delegating power to others operates, where those that we hand off authority to know so much more about what is going on in terms of decisions are being made than ordinary people do. Um, the periodicity of popular accountability, um, meaning like we are not, we do not have ongoing authority over our representatives. That is something constrained to limited periods every few years through elections. Um, and that creates a situation where there's little to no possibility uh, for constraining those representatives on the basis of any particular decision that they're making. Um, and I think that this periodicity of elections combined with the political disaggregation of the people ensures that elections are an extraordinarily weak mechanism for democratic accountability and for control over those exercising state power. Um, the reality of minority rule that this sets up also enables our leaders, be those in formal political offices like in Congress or state legislatures, um, those in union leaderships or that of other movement organizations, um, enables them to be dis diverted into conciliation with the ruling class as they develop their own particular minority interests and a distinct vantage point from which they're seeing the problems and possible solutions uh, to things. And I think that's a central part of, um, of how the, the, chain, the political changes that happen to people once they are elected into office. Um, and so I think all this means that when it comes to building a system from the ground up, we need to be consciously doing so um, around a fundamentally different logic 
a political organization, one which retains power um, at the base of our organizations and of our communities, um, and that is structured to actively resist the um, handing off of authority to uh, a small minority of us to make decisions on our behalf. I also want to talk a little bit about what I mean when I use the phrase direct democracy, because um, I think that encompasses a, a number of different key overlapping but distinct characteristics that are all really important. So the first most obvious is that this kind of democracy is direct, meaning it is unmediated by independence empowered decision makers. Uh, I think another key feature is that this kind of democracy is participatory, meaning it is consciously structured to enable and facilitate the participation of everybody, of anyone who um, is affected by the decisions that are being made, who's part of the community um, in, in that consideration, or who is part of that particular sphere of common life uh, over which democracy is being exercised. I think the third is that this kind of democracy is deliberative. Its decisions are emerging out of a process of discussion among the people rather than some kind of simple formal proceduralism of tallying up what everyone already thinks uh, as through things like referenda or other um, more conventional practices of, of direct democracy, which treats us all as isolated voters rather than a deliberative public that uh, can influence one another through the process of discussion and making decisions. The third is that, I mean, excuse me, the fourth is that this kind of democracy is radical, meaning it is not constrained to the realm of social life that we conventionally think of as government, of politics, but is spread uh, and extended into all spheres of common life, including the economy, the organization of armed force, the caretaking and stewardship of ecosystems. Um, that that the, the view of what belongs it to democracy is, um, is greatly expanded. And lastly, um, I think we need to think of this kind of democracy as revolutionary, as in it itself is a process of social struggle and transformation um, where the power of the people is set on a collision course with how things are presently organized, with the privileges and abuses of our present system that is organized according to uh, elite rule and through which that old system can be consciously and forcibly uprooted. Um, so another last thing I want to say about this kind of tension or, or uh, distinction between participatory uh, direct forms of democracy and representative ones is that there are many examples around the world of practices of participatory democracy that are nested within an existing representative system. See so things like this in Venezuela, in Cuba, in parts of India, um, and in many, many cities and countries all around the globe um, through things like participatory budgeting and other kinds of uh, inclusion of ordinary people in the process. And I think it's really important to distinguish the sovereign decision-making powers of the assembly from assemblies convened by higher authorities for the purposes of consultation. Um, and, you know, many of these experiments I think we can learn a lot from. Um, but I think our goals should be considerably more, more revolutionary. Um, another subject that we've kind of been talking about this week is how do we take small scale stuff and coordinate it beyond the local? You know, our struggle is regional, it is national, it is global. What kind of structures can we take, um, can we adopt that can deal with that scale? Um, that don't entail handing off decision-making powers to sort of kinds of top-down authority. And um, I think the, the basic organizing principle for how we can approach this is called federation, or sometimes called confederation. Um, and I think there's a few, um, I think there's a few like, sub-principles of how this can operate in concrete institutional terms to ensure that no matter what scale at which we're operating democratic decision-making, we can retain power and authority at the base in the hands of everyone um, without it being handed off to a select minority. Um, the first of these is continuous assembly, as in assemblies are not events that happen um, periodically with months or years in between them, um, such that um, we don't have an ongoing way of 
um, discussing and maintaining uh, contact with higher level uh, decision making bodies. The second is that when it comes to delegates or representatives, what we hand them is not independent decision making power, but an imp what's called an imperative mandate. I mean, this decision of the community that has been assembled has been made in that assembly and the person that they send on to uh, a higher scale body um, is someone who has already been given instructions about how to conduct themselves and what positions to argue for. Um, and and that, is, that is the imperative mandate. The third is the principle of transparency, that there is um, nothing that can be discussed at higher levels of, of the Federation that cannot be um, readily make its way back to um, to the, the assemblies at the bottom. Um, and that, that's a means of ensuring that the imperative mandates are actually being followed. The third, the, my third, this is fourth principle, is the principle of recall. And this is the enforcement mechanism of the imperative mandate um, through which if a delegate or representative from the assembly is failing to execute the decisions already made by the assembly, um, they can be brought back and replaced promptly um, by someone else who will be more dutiful to the will of those who sent them. The fifth is the principle of rotation. Um, and this is something we've discussed in a number of small groups that I've been in, um, and I think some of the long, larger ones. But a way of ensuring that the, the kinds of powers that are possessed by um, those roles cannot calcify in you know, single people who hold them over an extended period of time and ensuring that different people are occupying these roles of delegation um, is, I believe, a key way of ensuring that they do not develop um, any particular interests over the long term. And the last is the principle of ratification. That is, the decisions made by higher level bodies of uh, confederal direct democracy are then brought back down to the assemblies um, for re review and, and for their discussion and approval. Um, so, I think there's a number of different movement functions that assemblies play, and um, their, their position in the struggle I think shifts over time dependent on the depth of participation and, um, and the openings for laying claim to more governing powers than um, ours can presently make you know, alongside the existing institutions of the state. So, in my context, uh, and in the city of Detroit, the institution in the community landscape that is closest to something we might call people's assemblies is one called the Block Club. Um, it's hyper-local organizations of neighbors who come together um, to discuss community problems, execute uh, common solutions to them, and uh, many of them have entered into different kinds of campaigns and political struggles against um, development, gentrification, um, you know, corporations that are bad neighbors, and, and things of this nature. Um, and so in my experience, my own block club has um, acted simultaneously as a space for building community and relationships, as um, a container for organizing and mobilizing oppositional struggle against threats to the neighborhood. Um, in our case was um, the planning department of the city and um, industrial development that was um, uh, going to be a source of, of pollution in our neighborhood. Um, and then lastly, uh, serves, can serve as an organizational container or institutional nucleus of these other dimensions of the build and fight strategy that we've been discussing all this week. Um, so for my neighborhood assembly, this has meant um, it has been the, the container for mutual aid projects in our neighborhood, um, for building and stewarding a community garden, um, which maybe I should describe as a communal garden, um, because you know, many community gardens are plots where individual people can come and um, lay claim to a section that, that they personally steward. Um, ours is, is basically run on communistic terms. Anyone has can have any food from it, anyone can contribute to the labor that goes into it. Um, and that's the case for many of the gardens that are run by the community as a whole um, in, in this way. 
Um, it has been a container for establishing a cool library in our neighborhood. And, um, and is what we're building up to be the institutional container for bringing land and buildings in our neighborhood under communal control for collective purposes. And I'm happy to discuss any of the details of this um, with you all later if that would be helpful. Um, so the last framing thing that I want to discuss is how um, in organizational and institutional terms we should think about the relationship between organizations of what we might call the revolutionary minority can or ought to relate to um, assemblies as a space for the whole people to come together and make decisions. And um, at Symbiosis Summer last year, we had a conversation with Kali about this, um, in which he, he said he was wrestling with this because at the end of the day, having a vision about what kind of society we should have is undemocratic. Like if you pursue, it is a minority position that we are trying to bring to being in the world. And I think there's some really important contradictions here for us to think through um, when it comes to organizing self-governing institutions among people who are mostly not yet revolutionaries um, themselves. Um, so to that end, I'm gonna share a bit from the organizing strategy document of a revolutionary organization I was a part of in Detroit called Detroit Build and Fight. Um, this is now a defunct organization, but which along the way developed a lot of ideas that I think are <coughs> extraordinarily helpful and insightful for thinking through this precise problem. Um, and the core argument that we make in this is that a revolutionary movement must necessarily have a mass character. Um, and that cannot happen if we as revolutionaries are seeking to monopolize assembly democracy, um, for it to be democracy and for it to have revolutionary potential, um, it has to belong to everyone in the community. Um, so we broke up this strategy into, into four parts, like four key concepts that frame how we approach this specific problem. Um, those are dual power, direct democracy, ecology of movements, and organizational dualism. And uh, I'll read and explain each of those. So first, for dual power, we aim to organize the institutions of the new liberated world here within the present system, which can channel the popular power needed to overcome that system and its abuses. Those institutions of direct democracy that we are now creating will, we hope, replace capitalism in the state and govern the liberated society to come. In the context of the city of Detroit, this would entail the formation of a citywide federation of people's assemblies, institutionalized as block clubs, tenant organizations, or other hyper-local, directly democratic bodies of working class Detroiters, which taken together will be referred to throughout the rest of this as the mass organization. The autonomous power of the mass organization will carve out space for our community's self-determination politically and economically. It will constitute a counter power to the city government as well as to the state slash federal government and to corporate power, building the revolutionary potential of a dual power situation with the ultimate goal of the mass organization displacing these institutions of oppression <clears throat> in a revolutionary transfer of power to the people. In summary, these community institutions that we as revolutionary organizers seek to build in our neighborhoods are intended to accomplish the following three things. First, meet human needs within the present system, um, building community while ensuring, and building community while ensuring our collective survival, pending liberation. Two, build the popular power to confront and overcome the present system. And three, serve as the governing institutions of the free society to come that we are building together today, according to the principles of direct democracy, ecology, and the emancipation of all people. The second of these is direct democracy. We envision the mass organization as the institutional form for the self-determination of the people of Detroit. Self-determination is a hollow slogan so long as the ability to participate in decisions that impact our lives is not freely and equally available to all people. To serve its revolutionary purpose, the mass organization cannot be placed under the control of a select revolutionary leadership. And this is the central argument that, that we're making here. 
It must instead function as the organizational form of Detroit's own self-governance by the people of the city themselves, absent any special class of rulers. Structuring the mass organization along the lines of confederal direct democracy is essential for averting the pitfalls of past revolutionary struggles that consolidated their gains into a new ruling class. When larger scales of political organization are necessary, as in decisions made across multiple neighborhoods or even citywide, such, such that a face-to-face -face assembly of all people affected would not be possible, this must be conducted through rotating, recallable delegates conveying the positions of the assemblies that sent them rather than any standing body of decision makers. The democratic integrity of the mass organization necessitates political openness and cannot be an ideologically prescribed space beyond the minimal standards that allow free and equal democratic deliberation to take place. And some of those that um, we thought of are prohibitions on misogynistic, homophobic, or racist conduct as these undercut the ability of others um, uh, to participate in community decision making, as well as foregrounding the political participation of those often excluded from um, conventional politics, such as squatters, um, people without home, houses, and undocumented immigrants. And we envision the mass organization as a sort of insurgent public sphere, a social commons through which the whole community shares ideas, reaches decisions together about what they will do to nourish and protect their community, and exercises real self-determination by putting these decisions into effect. To be successful, the mass organization and its constituent parts must be spaces where any Detroiter can come and have a real say in how their community governs itself. This is the source of its popular legitimacy and what distinguishes it from the unaccountable system of rule from above that we seek to replace. This is not possible if the mass organization is set up to be politically insular um, by being under the control of an already revolutionary minority. Our role as revolutionaries is instead to assist in the mission of building the mass organization as a democratic space and then organizing and advocating for our ideas within that space to win ordinary people outside the activist milieu over to our revolutionary goals in great enough numbers to influence the overall political direction of the mass organization. So the third framing concept that we use is that of the ecology of movements. And um, we believe that we can build an explicitly revolutionary organization without undermining the democratic integrity of the mass organization by thinking in those terms of a movement ecology. And the idea is, in essence, that no single organization needs to accomplish everything, be everything, contain everything within a given social movement. Rather, organizations can best serve that movement by identifying where they fit into it, by identifying their niche, to continue the ecological metaphor and how they symbiotically relate to other parts of the movement in pursuit of their particular and common goals. It's precisely by identifying the role we can uniquely fill based on our capacities and the gaps that we see, rather than trying to make one thing be everything, that the movement can be a great, uh, the movement whole can be greater than the sum of its parts. And the last basic concept that um, pulls this all together is this idea of organizational dualism. Um, and um, in essence, that means that we approach our organizing work being very clear and explicit that Detroit Build and Fight is not and will not itself be the mass organization. We will instead operate as a cadre organization, an organization of like-minded radicals who share political principles and goals um, and work together to achieve them. The function of this cadre organization is to engage in collective study and refinement of the members' ideas and to organize their participation in wider movements, inserting themselves within those movements in order to influence them. And for us, that wider movement is the effort to build the mass organization in the city of Detroit. Um, this approach um, of an organizational dualism between an ideologically specific organization of revolutionaries and a larger, more open mass movement organization that those revolutionaries are seeking to strengthen and to influence has been termed by anarchists in South America as especifismo. Um, that practice of us embedding ourselves and assisting, embedding ourselves in and assisting in the construction of popular mass movements is referred to by the especifistas as social insertion. So 
when it comes together to putting together a specific strategy of how we approach this, um, we laid out the following as the tasks of this organization, as it was previously imagined. First, to hone a shared revolutionary political vision for the city of Detroit, rooted in the particular struggles, conditions, and contradictions of our unique context that can help us chart concrete pathways to the emancipation of all people and the creation of a truly democratic, egalitarian, and ecological society in the city and beyond it. Second, to train revolutionaries through our mutual education of one another, developing our skills as community organizers, facilitators, and communicators of our ideas, um, which would eventually extend into practical hands-on trainings in areas such as food cultivation, community defense, building restoration, and other necessary skills for building and defending a uh, new society here in Detroit. Third, to engage in social insertion in grassroots community organizations. Our members will take part in and lead efforts in their neighborhoods and workplaces to build autonomous institutions of resistance, directly democratic self-governance, mutual aid, and the solidarity economy. This means joining block clubs, tenant unions, and worker organizations where they already exist and building them with our fellow neighbors and workers where they do not. The bulk of our work as revolutionaries is organizing with the not yet revolutionary in our own communities. The purpose of DBF is to function as a political home for us to reconvene in, learn from, and strategize with uh, fellow revolutionaries on this long road to radical democracy in Detroit. Fourth, we must seek also to democratize these grassroots community institutions we participate in by organizing within them and push them to take on more radical and participatory local projects. For example, many block clubs in Detroit have an internally hierarchical structure that inhibits mass participation, <coughs> and we can organize within them to restructure them as horizontal assemblies. Fifth, to coordinate the activities of these revolutionary cadre who are active within these emerging, directly democratic, autonomous institutions towards the end of stitching them together into a citywide social force, a bottom-up federation of block clubs, community councils, people's assemblies, tenant unions, and other grassroots organizations that together could constitute the mass organization and the base of a dual power in the city of Detroit. And lastly, our purpose is to organize within the mass organization to build wider popular support for wielding its power to revolutionary ends. Such revolutionary ends for the mass organization include communalizing resources and property to construct a socialist economy, ecologizing collective life in our neighborhoods and the city as a whole, and seeking the devolution of political power from the local institutions of representative democracy, meaning the city council and the mayor's office, into the mass organization itself as the real institutional expression of direct democracy by the people of Detroit. We can also agitate within the mass organization to inject more explicit class struggle into its work on behalf of tenants against landlords, workers against employers, and poor and working people generally against the police. This entails organizing particular initiatives within the mass organization and advocating them through its democratic process as well as carrying out a broader program of revolutionary political education to spread our ideas and recruit the most active participants of the mass organization into the ranks of, of these revolutionary cadre. Such activities amount to operating as a revolutionary caucus within the directly democratic political structures of the mass organization. And so, as organizers playing a central role in the creation of these constituent parts of the mass organization, and the creation of the mass organization itself, being the federation of those block clubs and other community institutions, we can develop and, and gain significant credibility within our community organizations for influencing their priorities and how they operate. For any revolutionary mass movement, we need to persuade large numbers of ordinary working class people that our goals are worth fighting for and that the mass organization should be the vehicle for that fight, um, which I think we can position ourselves to accomplish. Um, so that's the, that's the overview of kind of like our thinking of how to approach this contradiction between there's not that many of us and we're trying to get everyone to govern ourselves. Um, and yeah, that's all I have prepared. I think we can maybe transition to 
um, either some questions about how assemblies function, um, how, what it takes to build them, and I can answer some of them, but I would love to have other people in the audience also chip in from their own concrete experience um, participating in assembly democracy and um, in navigating some of these challenges and contradictions. Oh, cool.